You can drop 100,000 of these packets for about a million bucks. And I think we can free the state of New Hampshire in about four years, two election cycles for about 2.5 million bucks. From Alcapulco, Mexico, this is Anarchast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the Internet. I've got a first-time guest coming on. I've known him for years. I've seen him. I don't even know. I think he's been at many in our uh, We've hung out many times. Uh, he kind of goes by a nom de plume with a book he wrote uh, called Understanding Our Slavery. The nom de plume is Etienne de la Boissy uh, squared. I'll let him explain why he chose that name. Uh, and uh, he actually was at an Arcapoco this year. He spoke on the advocacy stage about his book and about some of his concepts. He's also got another concept called the uh, pre-state project, something uh, similar to the free state project, and we're going to get into all that stuff. but it's kind of a little bit similar to some of the talks we've had lately about people just trying to figure out exactly how this system works, how did they manage to put this in place, and how to explain it to other people about what's actually going on. And I think it looks like he does a really good job. I, I heard his book has been one of the top sellers at the last few in uh, uh So uh, a lot of people really like it, and I have never had him on Anarchist. So we're going to have him on right now and talk about this. So Etienne, uh, bonjour, comment ça va? Uh, and uh, welcome to Anarchist. And first question I have to ask you, though, is, how did you become an anarchist? Ah, uh, bonjour. So, uh, hey, Jeff, good to see you again. And, uh, uh, man, uh, the road to voluntarism, the anarchy, really started with libertarianism. And I had uh, uh, Ron Paul came to talk to my college. And um, I, uh, I originally was a kind of conservative Republican, fiscally conservative, didn't really understand the ideas of liberty didn't want to be seeing Ron Paul at like it heard he was somewhat of a kook and within kind of like 30 or 40 minutes of him talking, uh, I realized I'd never heard a politician that made as much sense. And I said, Hey, I guess I'm a libertarian. And then uh, after I discovered it was really uh, Larkin Rose that put the final kind of piece in the puzzle. And uh, once I read uh, uh, the, the most dangerous superstition, um, I gave up minicurate, uh, minor, uh, Minicurism for uh, voluntarism and anarchy. That's great. And uh, how long ago was that exactly? You know, probably about three or four. Uh, no, man, six, six, seven years now. Where the it was really the final piece of the puzzle. Yeah. That's great. So it was a couple of years, maybe, from minicurism to anarchism. It usually takes most people six months, but I guess maybe you're a bit slow. You know, somebody turned me <laughs> off to it uh, when I was young, and they they literally. Uh, uh, kind of bad-mouthed anarchy, and it, and it I think it just put me off until I read The Most Dangerous Superstition, and then not only did that kind of, you know, fully uh, make me a nonviolent, uh, free-thinking, uh, a voluntarist anarchist, but it also really put the last piece of the puzzle in that, you know, that, that, that government, it really is organized crime, and they're using statism as a kind of a pseudo-religion, and they're slipping it to the population as a religion using kind of all of the tools and the techniques of what I like to call an unethically manipulative cult. And that's really what my book, Understanding Our Slavery, uh, How Organized Crime Runs the Government and the Media with Easy Solutions for Real Freedom, that's, that's really the focus is exposing this as the tools and techniques of intergenerational organized crime and government really isn't something designed to help you or to uh, protect you but it was designed at the outset to rob and enslave you I agree. And a number of people talk about this. Mark Passio in some ways, Max Egan. I just had on James True talking a little bit about uh, some of uh, how they've been doing this and what they've been doing. And I find it all fascinating. I think uh, we're all just putting together the pieces of the puzzle on how exactly we ended up in this situation where most of us are so enslaved and and so many of us seem to really love it and, and support it. Uh, Stockholm Syndrome and all that kind of stuff. So, so let's get into the book. So uh, what exactly uh, are you saying in the book or, or what do you want to say about the book to to let people know sure so i could go ahead and i can just kind of take take you through kind of like a quick view of the book sure. uh, but what i do in the book is so first off uh, in my day job i help fortune 500 companies learn at the speed of light and i know that most people are visual learners 
And so what I've, what I've done is I've tried to explain the tools and the techniques in a very, in a book that is rich with visualizations, infographics, historical photos, and memes, because 65% of people are visual learners. They learn faster when you show them a picture uh, and they, they come to kind of a deeper level of understanding. And so uh, the other thing that visualizations and infographics and memes does is it, is it expands the number of people that will engage with any book, you know, to, to an estimated kind of 35, 45 plus percentage of the population versus 10 or 15 with a book. And so what I've done is I have, uh, I've uh, uh, design this for wide widespread adoption because what I'm looking to do is expose this like I said as as you know as tools and techniques of intergenerational organized crime so the first part of the book is I take people through uh, 20 plus techniques that intergenerational organized crime uses to create the culture of slavery and tax slavery and then I show what it looked like in Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, East Germany, and the United States, so how, so people can see the historical pattern. And human beings are really, really good pattern recognition machines. And when you show them the pattern, then they come to insight kind of, you know, much quicker. And so I'll just take you just kind of real briefly through the techniques. But uh, when you see the big black, that's the, you know, I break down the technique, but they're all using what I like to call an artificially indoctrinated holy symbol, which is the flag. And they're using the flag, uh, they're product placing it in movies, they're using techniques like anchoring where they'll build up a moment of you know, high tension in a movie uh, and then uh, show you the flag. I would like to use the example of like Matt Damon ex ex you know, uh, trying to get off of uh, Mars and the Martian and there's big emotional buildup and then you know, is he gonna make it? And yes, he's gonna make it and they cut to earth and everybody's waving you know, the flag, and they take that moment of high tension and they anchor it to the flag. They're also doing that in football games or doing that in basketball games where somebody will, you know, score a touchdown and then we'll show them the flag. And then they're, you know, they're, you're promoting the religious, the religiosity of the flag and Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, things like that. They all have a, uh, a, a social contract that nobody signed, but everybody is expected to be a party to. They all have mandatory government schools employing the Prussian model of education. So they're gonna get the kids when they're young, they're gonna raise them in this kind of uh, pseudo religion of statism, they're gonna have them do the Pledge of Allegiance, they're going to you know, uh, do the common prayer of the, of the, of the Star Spangled Banner at the, at the sporting events, they're going to uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and probably half of the mandatory school is this, the hidden curriculum of status, and then half of it is a hidden curriculum of obedience and fealty. And so they're going to make you raise your hand to go to the bathroom. You can't go to the bathroom without the permission of a, of a government employee. Um, then, so that's kind of the first stage of, of uh, the uh, program. The second stage is a youth program that teaches citizenship, mind obedience, and state flag worship. And so that's the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts. Now you begin to get awards, Cub Scout adventure loops, or Boy Scout merit badges for uh, how to be a citizen, how to salute the flag, dress the flag. You can't, you're not allowed to throw the flag away when the flag gets old, you have to bury the flag. Uh, and you learn all of this in a, in a, in a program. Then the, uh, the youth program gets kind of creepy. Now we're going to uh, put the kids in uniforms. We're going to shave their heads. We're going to give them guns. This is the Explorer program. It's young Marines. It's uh, law enforcement ex ex uh, explorers. It's police explorers. They all force pledging oaths on the kids. They all artificially glorify the military and the police. And then any place you see, uh, you know, hypertext link, I, I link to the authoritative scholarship behind it. The U.S. government has been caught paying professional sports teams $53 million a couple of years ago. It was $53 million a year to include these pro-military, pro-government messages in, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the games. They all use political rallies. They all use propaganda. Um, so the CIA and the Department of Defense have had direct involvement in 800 plus major movies, 1,000 plus television shows, essentially everything you see on 
Netflix and Amazon uh, Prime and, you know, all of this where the CIA is the hero or the FBI or the DEA or the ATF or the president flying jet fighters to protect the country from invading aliens. <laughs> so they're, they're making the government the hero. They're using techniques like anchoring their product placing the flag. Um, yeah, just for people, uh, like, this is factual information. The uh, Department of, uh, I guess, the military, the Department of, I call it Department of Offense, uh, Department of Defense, I guess they call themselves in the U.S., they tweeted during the Oscar Awards this last year that uh, uh, we're so proud to have been such a part of all these movies, and, and they basically said that they, they approve or disapprove of, of all the movies and that sort of thing. So we're not, this isn't like uh, conjecture. This is actual factual. This is what they do. Oh, oh, absolutely. Like I said, so, you know, what, I, what I'm doing is uh, I'm, I'm making the, the PDF of the book available for free that has all of the links that takes you to the scholarship and to the research behind, you know, all of kind of the key claims in the book. And, you know, even when it's not like you can factually prove because the CIA and the DOD admit their involvement in these movies, they frequently provide military equipment, uh, funding. They often have script control where they're able to excise parts of the script to create, you know, or, or, you know, add elements of the script so that they're, you know, creating this kind of false narrative. Uh, but yeah, this is all, uh, you know, I'm backing up everything uh, in the book. And, you know, I've been selling the book for two years now. Uh, uh, and I have yet to have anybody, you know, say, hey, that's factually incorrect. Anything major, you know, typos aside, but, you know, anything major is factually incorrect. So um, I'll just continue with, the, you know, some of the techniques and then, we, and then we can kind of open it up. But they all use manufactured news, overt or surreptitious control of publishers, editors, and reporters to kind of create an artificial reality. And so the CIA's control of the press was first exposed during something called the Church Committee hearings in 1976, where it came out that the CIA had hundreds and hundreds of reporters and editors and you know, publishers on the payroll, and that they were using these, their, these media assets to, to get propaganda into the, you know, into the food chain. Um, they all use manufactured terrorism. They all use false flag events, manufactured intelligence and lies to start war. This is the Gulf of Tonkin incident. This is Kuwaiti babies tossed from incubators, weapons of mass destruction to, you know, to get whatever the war uh, of the day is. Um, right now, they appear to be blowing holes in oil tankers in, uh, outside of the UAE to stoke up a you know, war with Iran. Um, but, but it wasn't just, you know, it's not just the U.S., it's Nazi. So once you see that it's Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union and East Germany are all using these same, same techniques, then you, you really understand it's a playbook. And, and that's what I'm trying to do in this kind of first you know, part of the book is saying, hey, look, they're all running this playbook. Uh, they all use uh, political assassination. Um, they all have political temples dedicated to the state and the deities. And so what they do is they take, because remember they're, they're slipping kids an artificial religion. And so what they do is they take the kids to Washington, D.C. And I live outside of Washington, D.C. On, on that kind of the tech corridor that I call the Silicon Plantation. So I see it you know, all the time in the spring. Here come the kids. And they take the kids into the cathedral that is the capital that looks like the Vatican for a reason. And the building is huge and everything is kind of oversized to make people feel small and insignificant in it. And they, they take them into the temples along the Potomac and they show them the deities and it's very solemn and it's very reverent. And they're just conditioning the population into this kind of hidden pseudo religion of statism, uh, which is the government will take care of you. The government loves you. The, you know, we've got these mythical founding fathers that do not tell, that can, can never tell a lie. And, and so it's all, all part of the program. Uh, the main, they all have monopoly government fiat money that steals the value surreptitiously from the population. So this really is kind of one of the key techniques. This is the technique that pays for control of the media. This is the technique that pays for control of the government. 
is we're going to give banks the ability to create money out of thin air using fractional reserve banking, even though it's inflationary, and even though it steals the value out of everybody else's money, and then we're going to take the vast obscene profits that we're that we're literally stealing out of people the value of everybody's money the same as if they just reached their hand in your pocket and stole your money they're just kind of stealing the value out of the money in a way that most people don't really understand and we're going to take some of the that those obscene profits and we're going to plow them back into controlling the media so that you never nobody ever tells you uh, what, how you're being robbed and we're just going to give you distraction and deception and it allows us to control every screen and deceive every audience. Um, they all spy on the citizens. This is how you know they're good people. Uh, they all use torture as policy, which is how you know they're good people. And this is also what, what I like to call evidence of cacistocracy. And cacistocracy is ruled by the shit people, the worst people possible. And really, this is an example of kind of, you know, the mind control that, that, that the population is under to a certain degree, because you really have to be mind controlled to do something as, as horrible as torture somebody. And you really have to be mind controlled to, to support a government that is openly using torture and be supportive of it and still think that it's a legitimate, you know, government as if there is such a thing as a legitimate government. But you, you get the idea. I mean, it really, like once... The population finds out that their government is using torture. That should be, you know, I'm out. But but uh, but if you're but if it's an, if it's if it's a religious indoctrination program, the 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 overly religious statists will just find excuses to justify what is completely unjustifiable. Um, they all run secret prisons, for-profit prisons, concentration camps, and black sites. Here in the United States, you know, in addition to kind of, you know, the well-known CIA black sites or uh, Camp Delta, at Guantanamo Bay, they're also running something called communication management units where they're keeping political prisoners from being able to talk to the outside world. And they have over 1 million, currently the United States is imprisoning uh, around 1 million nonviolent uh, 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 victim uh offenders that are in for-profit prisons, many for-profit prisons for victimless crimes. And so they're, they're incarcerating nonviolent people who have not, you know, hurt anybody. They're saying that the government is the victim or the state is the victim. And they're, you know, putting people in victimless crimes where they're having them work for pennies uh, an hour for these cartel companies and so again, you know, these are, this is just, uh, you know, uh, uh, examples of, uh, of, of horrific things that the government is involved in. They all use conscription, they all have manufactured enemies, and they all use paid political violence. That is the end of the first part of the book. And that is really so that people can really see the, you know, can see the, uh, uh, the, the historical pattern and, and realize that, hey, the government's running a playbook, and it's the same playbook the Nazis used, it's the same playbook the Soviets used, it's the same playbook the East Germans used. The middle section of the book is, uh, is uh, what I call a one-pager, and so you may or may not have known, noticed that they're using religious symbolism in the propaganda, but again, because human beings are great pattern recognition machines, if I show you three dozen examples of halos and penumbras and bush in front of the cross you know you come you know most people go hey that's a pattern i get it uh that's not on accident they're doing that on purpose i break down what the religion of statism is i break down the shady history of the constitution so uh, uh they hijacked uh, a uh um they, they hijacked a convention that it was convened just to amend the Articles of Confederation, and they used, uh, and after half the delegates wouldn't participate, wouldn't even show up, left in disgust, or wouldn't sign, they produced this unauthorized um, uh, uh, constitution that essentially gave them the ability to begin taxing and controlling the population and, and I explain why the whole thing is illegitimate, because there is no constitution, there is no 
coronation, there is no ceremony or political ritual that can legitimately give one man the ability to rule and control another man. I explain the history, the shame history, the Pledge of Allegiance. And so the, so the, so, and just to kind of back up for a second, so the, so with the, with the, the, the second thing that my book is kind of exposing is that organized crime is using control of the media to create control of perception in the population that the whole thing is legitimate. And back in the, during the ratification debates, this included taking, uh, this included um, uh, accusations of mail tampering. Um, in Pennsylvania, they appear to have bought off the stenographer so that he was only transcribing Federalist speeches and not anti-Federalist speeches. And then they withdrew all of the subscriptions from a newspaper called the Pennsylvania Herald, which was the only newspaper reporting on the, the quote unquote ratification debates because people still didn't want to have this, you know, uh, uh, this government, this federal government. And so they just silenced the voices. And then in the shady history of the Pledge of Allegiance, I tell the story how Freemasons running a media company in 1892, uh, running a magazine called the Use Companion, which, which had a circulation of 500,000 uh, uh, in, in, the, in the 1890s. You can see their building here in Boston. It still stands today. It's a five-story building. They call it the Pledge of Allegiance building in Boston. Take a look at the size of that building to understand the size and scope of the media operation that sold the Pledge of Allegiance, the, what came to be known as the Bellamy Salute, into the school system. And so it was, the, it was organized crime running the government and the media, and they really needed to have military socialism and socialism because you can't control people without government, you can't control people without socialism. And so what they did is they uh, had a premium program that when you got a subscription, they would give you a federal flag for your classroom. They'd never been in the, in the schools before. Nobody had ever had the federal flag really in the schools before. And in addition to, to selling the population on this robotic, you know, chanting and, and forced, you know, Pledge of Allegiance, they also sold them on something that became known as the Bellamy Salute, which most people know as the Hitler Salute. And so in addition to the, to the Pledge of Allegiance, they would do what was called the Bellamy Salute, which started out as a salute, like a military salute. And then when you said, I pledge allegiance to the flag, you would go, and you would stick, you would extend your hand gracefully, palm upward, and that's the picture on the front cover of the book. And um, after time, the kids didn't do that at all. They just kind of stuck their hand up, uh, Heil Hitler style. And that's the way that the majority of the country did the Pledge of Allegiance was with the Heil Hitler, what is known today as the Heil Hitler salute. Um, the Italians adopted it in 1919. Uh, the Nazi party adopted it in 1936. The German army adopted it in 1943. We quit doing it on Army Day in 1940. Uh, 19, sorry, they did it in 1944. We quit doing it on Army Day 1943. We switched to the hand over the heart uh, ma, uh, uh, that we use today, or some people use today. But that is... Uh, how they got military socialism and uh, into the schools. Um, I, I, in, in the book, um, I, I have, if you want to see videos of, of kids doing the Heil Hitler salute, um, this one is uh, any place in the PDF that you click on, a, you click on something, it just kind of opens it uh, up and plays the video. And this is a movie from 1925 called The Vanishing American, and it shows American Indian kids being indoctrinated into this hidden religion of statism. So if you take a look at the Indians, they were free, they were proud, they were living alone on this continent without any government. Uh, and here comes organized crime. Uh, they they, they uh, massacre them. They steal their land. And then the first thing they do is they take the they take the once free, proud Indians, they put them into mandatory Indian boarding schools where the where the where they are where they are give them the the Prussian model of education and they teach, raise them up in the in in the flag 
I go into what the hidden curriculum of the government school system is. I go into the private Federal Reserve and the theft of fractional reserve banking. Um, I explain so that so it's the banks at the top of the food chain taking their ticket, their little paper tickets, and turning them into uh, plant property and equipment. And so they're buying the world. This is a study done, uh, 2011 study called the Network of Global uh, Corporate Control. They analyzed 37 million global companies, 43,000 transnational uh, corporations, and discovered 147 firms control 40% of global wealth. So it literally is like you're playing Monopoly with friends. The banker is cheating. He's reaching under the table. He's stealing $500 bills. And at the end of the game, the banker owns everything on the board and everybody else is renters and debtors. Um, I explained the propaganda matrix. And so this is, you know, a portion of a, of a media ownership chart where you can just see two of the six major companies that are kind of controlling every screen and deceiving every audience. But, you know, if you tell people that there are six companies that control every single media outlet in the, in the country, they may or may not believe you. But if you show them a media ownership chart, uh, there's News Corp with its 175 newspapers and internet properties and magazines, and television programming and television stations and book publishing companies and satellite networks. And, you know, now all of a sudden they come to a kind of much deeper uh, understanding. Um, this is another chart that I have uh, called uh, that shows, okay, so that's how they own the, the physical radio stations and television stations and satellite networks. This is a chart, a 2017 chart by Swiss Propaganda Research. You can click on it and expand it in, you know, to the, into the whole chart. Uh, but what they do is they have um, three organizations the Council on Foreign Relations, Bilderberg, and the Trilateral Commission, where they're, they've maneuvered their membership into, um, into kind of all of the key publishers, editors, uh, um, publishers, editors, uh, reporters, and all of the major uh, uh, publications. And this is how they get um, their, uh, their uh, propaganda across dozens and dozens and dozens of different mainstream uh, media um, uh, sites. A uh, couple more and then we'll move on. This is, this, this, is a different, uh, this is a different chart that shows the same three groups, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, and Bilderberg Group that have their membership in everything from the presidency, vice presidency, Federal Reserve System, cabinet officials, uh, members of Congress, CIA, FBI, Export-Import Bank, Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, the major banks, Citigroup, uh, 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 Goldman Sachs, and crew. And this chart shows that control going back decades through Republican administrations and Democratic administrations. So it doesn't matter who's in power, this really is the kind of the real you know, power structure. I get into uh, the debilitation program, so they're providing uh, certain companies unlimited funds to consolidate their own industries. Uh, every time you see uh, one of these lines, uh, that's where one of these companies has been funded to buy up its competition. And then these are the companies that are putting garbage in the food supply. So this is a, a study showing uh, glyphosate uh, made by Monsanto, which was just found guilty in a third uh, trial with a $2 billion verdict for uh, its uh, cancer-causing uh, uh, chemical glyphosate that's in, uh, that's in Roundup. But it's not just that they're spraying the, the wheat with, with glyphosate right before uh, harvest, in a, you know, but they're also putting recombinant bovine growth hormone in the dairy, aspartame, fluorinated water in beverages, uh, glutamates, kind of you name it. They're making the food addictive and they're making it harmful. Uh, and now they're trying to genetically modify organisms and crops. So I get into what genetically modified organisms are. This is a, a chart showing, the, showing Monsanto and Bayer, which just bought Monsanto Consolidating Seed Industry. And so if you, had, if you could see the rest of the chart, there's two more companies, Dow and DuPont, that have collectively bought hundreds and hundreds of seed companies. 
And so if you take a look at who's putting these toxins in the food system, who's trying to buy up the seed companies in an effort to control the food supply, these are military contractors that have historically bought uh, uh, toxins for the military. Um, I go into why, uh, how they uh, created, uh, or they've made anarchy and voluntarism uh, um, uh, mean chaos and dystopia when it really just means uh, no rulers. And I go into even how they uh, have changed the meaning of the word anarchy over time by comparing the 1928 version of anarchy with the current Merriam-Webster version of anarchy. And when I went to get the screenshot of the current version, um, they were actually promoting the word socialism on two different spots where you can promote a word or a concept on the Merriam-Webster dictionary page. And they were, while they're tarring anarchy as utopian and something that prevailed in the ghetto, they're saying that socialism uh, would ensure economic growth and a fair distribution of income. And so, there, so if you take a look at who owns the dictionary, it's the Saffer Banking family. And again, uh, Leslie Gell, the president emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations, sits on the editorial advisory board. So it's the, so you're seeing the, the same people, uh, you know, uh, back and forth. The rest of the book is meme war. And so I go into the ridiculous illogicness of government and democracy, voting, got mandatory government schools, not understanding that both parties are owned by the same uh, folks. Um, but that's really the book. And what I've tried to do, like I said, is I've tried to do this so that we can, so that it's so that it's easy for people to understand. It expands the number of people that will engage in it, and I'm setting it up for wide distribution to expose this, uh, expose these techniques in a way that the majority of the population can very easily understand and process. That's great. Uh, great it's a compilation of everything that's going on all into one book. And I really like how you uh, compared the U.S., I call it the USSA, to uh, Nazi Germany, East Germany, and the Soviet Union, because a lot of Americans, when they hear Nazi Germany or Soviet Union, they're like, oh, we're the opposite of them. Uh, and then when you go through and just say, uh, actually, it's pretty much exactly the same. There's some differences uh, in, in how they do things. And there's some, obviously some differences in culture and things like that. But in general, the, the top-down control is, is almost exactly the same. So I think that's a, a great uh, way to uh, show people this information. I think people are starting to wake up to it in various ways, uh, but they're, they're very confused about it. And uh, of course, I've been saying for a long time that these <laughs> governments are just criminal organizations. That's all they are. But incredibly smart criminal organizations. I think your average person out there, when they, uh, you know, your average person who's been indoctrinated and, and through all the things that you just uh, spoke about, uh, when they talk about uh, why we need government. A lot of them will bring up, well, if it wasn't for government, there'd be, you know, criminals would be everywhere and they'd take over everything. It's like, well, that's exactly what it is today. But incredibly savvy criminals, like what a incredibly smart system. Like I, I couldn't even imagine how you could come up with this uh, and have it like so all encompassing to the point where most people don't even know they're enslaved in the system. Do you, do you have any thoughts on like just how incredible this is and, and how they came to be able to do all this uh, over time, it's really, it's very impressive. Yeah, so you know, my nom de plume is Etienne de la Boissy squared, and the original Etienne de la Boissy was a French political philosopher that wrote in the kind of the 16th century, and he wrote something called The Discourse of Voluntary Servitude, and he was really the first to really catalog the tools and the techniques that monarchs, the organized crime of the time, used to create obedience and fealty to the, you know, to the, to, to the monarchs. And if you take a look and extend that, that system out through, you know, common time, I think that the main tool and techniques technique really is control of perception. And so, you know, in the book, in addition to the examples that I gave of them controlling perception during the ratification debates and controlling perception uh, at, uh, you know, getting the, the federal flag into the, you know, into the schools using, a, you know, a media company run by Freemasons. You know, I also cover uh, Congressman Oscar Calloway's, um, uh, you know, who, who, who had inserted into the congressional record um, the fact that J.P. Morgan interests in, I want to say, 1915 
uh, you know, essentially bought control of the top 25 newspapers. And, you know, and, and, you know, they said, hey, well, how many newspapers do we need to, you know, kind of control the, you know, the, you know, the, um, uh, the uh, you know, the, the, the press as a whole in the, in the country, they figured out it was the top 25, you know, newspapers, according to Congressman Callaway, they supplied an editor for each of these papers and, and would, you know, pay kind of monthly to, you know, to have that level of control. If you take a look at the media ownership chart and, uh, and uh, you know, the Council on Foreign Relations Bilderberg Trilateral Commission chart that I showed a second ago, that extends today. So, what, you know, now you can actually, you know, what I'm trying to do is trying to make something that's hidden visible by showing, you know, kind of the visualizations, the CIA's, uh, you know, program that was exposed during the um, church committee hearings in 1976 is another example. So we're, we're, brought, we're paying, uh, you know, we're paying people to put our propaganda into the news cycle. And um, uh, if you grow up in the sea of propaganda and every single thing that you see is telling you that the system is legitimate, um, you're going to grow up thinking the system is legitimate until somebody shows you something that exposes the game, that makes it easy for you to understand how they've been doing it, that gives you the, hit, the history. It's very, you know, well, uh, well documented. But that control of perception program, that is really the way they've done it. And, you know, one of my board of advisory members has a great saying, He's, he, you know, he says, you know, analogy, he says, if you're stealing trillions of dollars, what do you call the couple hundred billion a year you spend to control the media? It's the marketing budget. And so, you know, the, they're, they're stealing so much money through military industrial complex fraud, the TARP, the TALF, the bailouts, uh, Amtrex as it lost, you know, almost a billion dollars on food and beverage alone, the Postal Service lost 57 billion, the, Penta, the Pentagon can't account for, for 10, uh, trillion dollars because their computers don't talk to each other. All these, you know, like uh, Social Security has been raided and they've got a bunch of IOUs and a file cabinet in West Virginia. I mean, this is a like a wholesale theft and it really costs them, you know, nothing to control the media. It might as well be, they're stealing so much, it might as well be free to control the media and it isn't until and, and you know and it isn't until somebody understands the system that they're able to free themselves from the kind of mental and slavery of not understanding that every screen is designed to distract or deceive. Yeah, it's interesting you use, use the word uh, perception. Uh, David Icke is another person who talks a lot about how all these things uh, work. And uh, he actually wrote a book called Perception, Deception. He talks a lot about perception. And I think you're right. Uh, it really is. They've, they've really somehow managed to get, you know, control people's minds. And, and really, when you look at the word government, it's a, it's a, a Latin word. Govern, gubernare is, is to control. Ment is mind. It's mind control. <laughs> it, it's absolutely just an ingenious system. Uh, and we're all just sort of like some like many people haven't woken up at all but some of us are starting to figure out how it all works now and you pointed out that it's really important for them to control the media and the internet has really caused them a lot of problems in that respect uh, and and of course now we're seeing them trying to censor the internet trying to shut down calling everything fake news everything except for the true fake news which is the government news which is the mainstream media propaganda channels uh, but uh, I think people are starting to wake up um, and so you, you you mentioned earlier that you have a bit of a plan you want to get this book out there you're also working on something called the pre-state project uh do you see some hope that we can get this stuff out there and and people more people will start to wake up uh and if more people wake up do you think that this whole system might just go away oh yeah yeah so i'm incredibly optimistic i mean the reason that they're censoring us on the internet is we're winning <laughs> the war of ideas slowly and surely among the intelligentsia or among the people that are paying attention and so I, I've been, you know, kind of tracking myself kind of four stages of censorship. And the first one was kind of in May of 2018 last year where I got uh, whacked off of Facebook. So they didn't censor me in October. They, they, they began censoring me in May. They took down 
uh, voluntarist Brian Young, who does high impact flicks. They, they, you know, got rid of this, uh, uh, YouTube channel that had, you know, uh, fifth, what was it? 500,000 subscribers, a hundred million views of his, uh, of his posted content. They took down some other people and kind of like the beta test. Then there was kind of like the second wave where they publicly whacked Alex Jones. And that, I think that was kind of like June or July of, um, of 2018. And they picked uh, Alex Jones because he's a controlled opposition mouthpiece. And they, want, you know, they, they made it very, very public and half the country hates him. And, and like half the country was like, oh, great. Yeah, I'm glad you got rid of him, not understanding that that if they say, you know, that they're going to censor somebody you like next that's trying to get the truth out to you. And so they made that very, very public. And then the third wave was uh, in October when they took down 251 individual people off Facebook. They took down, uh, I want to say, 590 something Facebook pages, including the Free Thought Project, which had 2 million uh, fan plus fans on Facebook. They took down uh, the, the Free Thought Project, lost their Facebook page, their Twitter account, and got a strike against them on YouTube all in the same day, which shows that this is a coordinated campaign across multiple different platforms. This uh, we, In the past kind of two weeks, we've seen the fourth wave of censorship. They took down Alex Jones again. Again, they, they, they let him back on to take him down again because they know he's divisive. They know that half the population is going to root and cheer when it gets taken down and cheer for censorship. But they took down Louis Farrakhan. They took down Milo. Um, but they also took down, they just took down John Rappaport off of uh, his, his WordPress blog. Um, and the Atlantic Magazine came out with an article, so, uh, you know, exposing that they're uh, algorithmically censoring uh, videos showing war crimes in Yemen and Syria and uh, and other kind of war zones, and so there. So so now, what I think is that that's the public wave. So I, I think we're going to see another wave where well, the, we already covered Milo and Alex Jones and this, and now we don't have to cover these other people that we're going to censor in a week or two. You know, kind of right before they're ratcheting up this war, like this war in. Uh, uh, potential war with Iran, the trade war with China, the, the uh, regime change in Venezuela. And so the reason that, that they're censoring is, uh, us is because on a level playing field, our ideas would be winning. People would understand what anarchy and voluntarism really are. And so they're having to kind of censor us. Now, what is the Achilles heel? And so, you know, I'm in my day job, I mentioned, uh, you know, productivity expert that uh, helps, you know, Fortune 500 companies earn, uh, learn at the speed of light. And so I put on my kind of productivity expert and I tried to figure out the most cost effective way to win the whole thing, to take it all down. And what I believe is that the Achilles heel is, is freeing one state, getting around the censorship of the mainstream media and the major internet properties that have been funded surreptitiously by organized crime to consolidate all their competition to ensure that Facebook is on top as the social media engine and Instagram and to ensure that they have the winners. And so to get around that, uh, what my goal is, is I call it the pre-state project. And that is to free a single state by dropping 100,000 Cop hard copies of the book, and also I have a flash drive. Uh, it's called a wafer drive um, with eight gig of evidence backing up everything in the book, all of the visualizations, the media ownership charts. I've got documentaries. I've got podcasts. I've got uh, truth music from the leading artists of the truth movement. I've got dank liberty memes. And getting out what's being hidden from the pop population in a very, very big way in New Hampshire. And why New Hampshire? For those of your audience that aren't familiar with the Free State Project, uh, the fr I, mine is the Free State Project, but I'm supporting an effort in New Hampshire called the Free State Project. I know you've had uh, Matt from the Free State Project on before. But there are, they have organized 23,000 plus 
libertarians, voluntarists, anarchists that have pledged to move to New Hampshire, concentrate their efforts in one specific geography. There's almost 5,000 on the ground right now. They've been there and working on this since 2003. They've elected 45 plus uh, uh, freedom activists to the legislature. They have 20, uh, around 20 uh, serving in the legislature right now. They have, they have foundations, they have co-working spaces, they have groups that are doing everything from working on secession to putting little pop-up mini libraries of, of truth books and material in laundromats. And so there's this truth revolution going on in New Hampshire. And so as a kind of productivity expert, um, I said, hey, it's probably easier to get the libertarian leaning in New Hampshire to convert and to understand that this is organized crime, explain the tools and techniques, than to get people to physically move from where they are. And so if you really want to accelerate it, the key to accelerating the free state project is to wake up the libertarian leaning in the state. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm raising a $50,000 seed round to start a voluntary think tank that would on one hand study these uh, it study the problem not as politics, but as um, but as intergenerational organized crime using control of the government and the media in a way that is uh, that you know that's, that's scholarly. Where we're backing everything up with with uh, um, uh, authoritative uh, scholarship and research, but we're also using visualizations and these these media ownership charts to kind of. Uh, you know, show the pattern. So we're using kind of the psychology of people learn so that we can bring people into insight as fast as humanly possible. Uh, the, the, the book and flash drive drops would be, a, would be accompanied by a DVD of Vax and vaccine safety education. And so the, we want to also expose this, you know, program to, to kind of debilitate the pub, public so that they don't understand how they're being uh, robbed. And so we think that vaccine education is the perfect companion issue because it exposes that the government can't be trusted. The government has been lying. They have known, you know, they, they have, they've been, you know, covering up the evidence that these vaccines are causing neurological issues in kids. And so the, the book drops would drive people to town hall meetings where we would have kind of, you know, uh, speakers and we would introduce them to the, to, the, to the liberty movement in New Hampshire. And so the, my thesis is, is we can achieve what's kind of known as the hundredth monkey effect, where if enough of your friends and neighbors kind of know about something, then you're going to kind of eventually find out about it because we're going to get everybody talking about it. And so nobody's ever done it before. But I believe if we can win one state, and that state is New Hampshire because it has a sub 1.3 million population, it's, it's, a, it's tiny enough to be able to canvas the state effectively. It's already got the free state project there. It's already got 20 you know, elected libertari uh, libertarians and freedom lovers. If we can win New Hampshire, then we win, uh, then the others, then I believe it'll spread you know, by states as, as it would be impossible for the rest of the country to ignore the fact that New Hampshire is either number one, seceding from the union, or number two is just, there's a widespread Gandhi, Martin Luther King-esque civil disobedience that says, hey, we're not paying taxes anymore. We're not going into the army anymore. We're not putting our kids into Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts or these mandatory government schools. We see what's happening. And if that happens, then that would be absolutely impossible to, you know, to ignore for the rest of the country. Um, and so then everybody kind of finds out about all this evidence of government criminality, all this evidence of this, you know, hidden curriculum of statism and obedience of the school system. And so if we win one place, uh, we win uh, the whole thing. So it's a 50K seed round to get started. I think I can test it in one community for about 150K. I think uh, you can do you can do a hundred you can drop a hundred thousand of these packets for about a million bucks, and I think we can free the state of New Hampshire in about four years, two election cycles for about two point five million bucks. And so that's what uh, what I'm working on. And if there's anybody in your audience that would like to help, please get in touch with me. Like I said, we're trying to raise this seed round of funding right now, and uh, that's the that's kind of the plan. 
Very interesting, and I, I love your optimism, and I am quite optimistic as well. I, uh, I've i seen so many changes just in the last 20 years. Around 2001, 9-11 is when I started to wake up to everything, and uh, I remember even like in 2005 telling people 9-11 uh, is the inside job, and almost everyone thought I was crazy, like literally crazy. Like, are you crazy? It was on TV. They said it was Osama bin Laden, right? And, uh, and now it's very rare I run into anyone who doesn't know that. Like, everyone's like, oh, of course it was a false flag. Like, I'm sure there's people who still don't know, but I'd never run into them personally. Of course, I hang around with mostly libertarian people, but I'll be in, like, airports, and I, I might bring it up at a bar or something, and people are like, oh, yeah, I, I know. Uh, and um, and all this other stuff, too. People are starting to wake up. You look at the amount of people who think the media is giving them good information. It's, like, less than 10%. Uh, the con Congress, it's called Congress for a reason. It's a con game. Uh, but uh, I think it's, like, less than 10% of people think that they're doing anything that's useful to them uh, or helpful or anything good. Um, so, like, we're almost reaching that point, and, and this information's kind of gotten out there in various forms so far, so they're having a really hard time stomping it out now. And it, you mentioned the, the Free Thought Project, many others. They, they stomp them out in one area, and, and they mostly find other ways that they can still get their information out there. Now, of course, it's very hard, and that's why if you do follow any of them, whether it be Free Thought Project, Anti-Media, uh, uh, We Are Change, you know, there's so many, James Corbett, whatever, there's so many of them. Um, try to help them out in one way or another because they're just, they're, they're literally getting just stomped on every day in various ways. And they somehow still, they manage to find ways around it, which is really amazing and awesome and totally to be uh, respected. But they, they really could use help. So if you ever see, you know, uh, donate some money or, you know, just click or share their videos because even videos like this, like Anarchast used to get easily 20, 30, 40,000 views to every video. Now it's like 5, 10, 15. We're getting shadow banned. Uh, they're just making it so and I'm, I'm surprised we're still on YouTube it might not be much longer we might not be on Facebook much longer everyone else is the same uh, so make sure you sign up to our email list so, so we can keep in contact so we can still get you out this information we'll, we'll never stop until they kill us <laughs> but but uh, you know like the, it will be harder and harder for us to get this information out there so make sure you're supporting people and people like Etienne who's who's working on a project here I, I would stay start with the book uh, maybe you can tell people where, where they can get the book I don't know if it's on Amazon or if it's a PDF or whatever it is, uh, and then let them know where uh, where they can find out about what you're trying to do with the uh, pre-state project. And if you if you like that, uh, support it, Etienne. Yeah, so I just I actually just uh, sold out of the third printing of the book, but you can download the book for free at understandingourslavery.com. And if you go to the Art of Liberty tab, you can get a, you can get the executive summary for the pre-state project. Uh, we're doing this, you know, we're we're, we're essentially doing this. Uh, that, you know, we're, we're looking at um, the liberty movement and we're saying, you know, just, you know, like a, like a business, uh, like, a, like a startup, and we're saying we've got the most cost-effective way of achieving liberty. And, uh, and so, we're, so we've got an executive summary that, you know, just like you would expect if you were uh, looking, you know, evaluating it, you know, any, any other kind of investment. Um, but uh, if you want to understand our slavery, you got to go to understandingourslavery.com. I'm working on uh, getting a, a fourth, uh, fourth uh, third edition of the book, fourth printing. Um, I've got 100 plus improvements to the book, so that'll be coming out soon. And the goal is, you know, right now um, it's very, very, ex you know, expensive. The next printing should be, you know, around 450 or so copies. It's very expensive to do this in kind of low uh, volumes. And so one of the other things I, I, I'm looking for is, a, is an idea philanthropist that would like to see this get out widely to help us, uh, you know, uh, get the cost down, you know, so instead of having to sell it for uh, tw uh, $25, I can sell it for $10 by moving to kind of a magazine format, but you can get all the details, like I said, at understandingourslavery.com. That's great, and uh, glad to hear that your book has sold out. Uh, it's funny because Larkin Rose is uh, the most dangerous superstition, which you brought up earlier, is a book that really affected you. Uh, he actually is sort of raising some money right now to print up more because he sold out all the ones that he has. So that, that's really good news that, uh, you know, these kind of books are like that popular that they're selling out all the time. Uh, and so uh, definitely check it out. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, share down below. Uh, if you like what Etienne had to say and you'd like to see him speak at Narcopoco next year, definitely put 
put in your comments there. We haven't uh, decided on any speakers yet. We're going to be starting to look at them in the next few weeks, and it won't just be up to me. So don't get mad at me if you, someone's not on the list and someone is on the list. There'll be a committee of people doing that. Uh, but uh, we're, we'll be uh, definitely looking at you at 10. I, I really like your your work, your book there. Uh, at some form or another, we're going to be speaking at Anarchapoco again in 2020. We haven't decided the dates yet. That'll all be decided in the next few weeks. Just stay tuned uh, on anarchapoco.com. Sign up to the email list again because, like I said, um, I'm surprised we're still on YouTube. I'm surprised <laughs> we're still on Facebook, uh, both Anarchast and the Dollar Vigilante for the stuff I say. But uh, so far, we're still on, but uh, don't expect that to last too much longer by the, the looks of things. Uh, but we're not going to ever stop doing what we're doing. Uh, so, like I said, just, you know, it really helps us just like and subscribe and, and share uh, with people. Anyone out there who doesn't know, you know, basically we call them uh, mind controlled, uh, brainwashed slaves uh, because that's basically what they are. But you know, it's kind of like it doesn't sound too nice when you're talking to people who don't know they are already. Uh, but but that's really what they are. And if you know a lot of and like you probably know tons of people who are, maybe pass them along this video. You know, it's very professional, this book, send them this book. Um, and it might open their eyes. You know, different forms, you know, like Etienne said, it was the book, The Most Dangerous Superstition that opened his eyes. You never know what's going to wake someone up. So so just keep doing that. That's really all we need to do. And I really believe that if, if all of us do that, we, we're, we just all the time try to wake someone up, try to give them something. No, don't be in their face. Don't go, you're a brainwashed slave and get all mad at them. Just go, hey, you should read this book or hey, check out this video. And they might get mad or they might go, oh, that was stupid. Uh, but you'll actually have put something in their head and then if they see it again down the road, they might go, oh, that's weird. I kind of saw something like that last year. Maybe I should pay attention to it, that sort of thing. And that's really all it takes. And that's what the, the, the power structure doesn't want you to know is that we do have the power. And if we, we can wake people up, we can change the world and we can actually get rid of this entire structure if enough people wake up. All we have to do is stop going along with it and it's over. It's that simple and that's what they don't want you to know. So check out Etienne's stuff. We'll have the links down below. Thank you for watching. Like I said, like, subscribe, share. Just hit the little like button there. It really helps us out. And that's it for Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. Anarchapoco is so hype, I'm trying to tell ya This the event of the year and best vacation ever Ryan Potter, Jeffrey Tucker, just to name a few Get your tickets, you don't want to miss it You should roll through, talking politics to health and self-improvement to investing So many things, not one thing, learn how to live life unchained, yeah Four days vibing on the beach, time to connect All about growth, way more than a conference This is Anarchapoco, yeah Let's go. You ain't seen nothing yet.